it's, it's a delight to, to be here and uh, I had a, a fantastic slide presentation and you're really lucky not to have to see it. <laughs> I, I find it very entertaining but other people find it a little bit dull. Um, but I, I kind of uh, want to have uh, an opportunity to um, uh, talk to you about something that had been bothering me since I was here last. So I started thinking, about why on earth does art therapy, or art therapies I should say, why does it make people better? Why does it work? What is the mechanism uh, that actually explains to us that people benefit from uh, engaging in a very wide range of activities that you might say have probably have limited or stand, you know, obviously just a limited amount in common. So I've been kind of thinking about it, puzzling about it. So if I'm going to be involved uh, in this uh, worthy enterprise that Dominic has added, it kind of behaves. I should think a little bit about why it works. Why it works, you know. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't work, but uh, uh, just in case that it does, I should know why. So I've been thinking about it, and I've been thinking about uh, also um, another aspect uh, that uh, uh, has brought me, which is um, uh, I'm now. Uh, one of the things that I do is um, being the national clinical lead for children and young people's improved access to psychological therapies. So um, we kind of, you know, we're all out there pushing psychological therapies and we're pushing out uh, CBT, but we all know CBT works, you know, everybody knows that CBT works. But we're also pushing out uh, parenting training. Well, that does parenting. That, that, of course, you know, lots of randomized control trials, that works as well. We're also pushing out. Uh, uh, systemic family therapy uh, you know, and interpersonal psychotherapy. So we're pushing out all of these but all these psychotherapies that can all seem to work. Um, and um, why? I mean, you know, doesn't that worry you sometimes when you wake up in the morning? No, maybe not. Maybe it's just me. Anyway, I kind of wake up in the middle of the night and I worry about these things. Uh, it's just a sad fact. That's why I'm here rather than watching TV and watching the Olympics. Uh, but Maybe that's some of that um, uh, 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 kind of commitment to academia you share, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So, uh, why does it work? Uh, well, one of the interesting things uh, about um, uh, art psychotherapies, any, any uh, particular kind of psychotherapy, um, not just the metaphors that uh, uh, I really prefer to, but is um, uh, he also hinted about? Uh, he said, "Well, it's non-verbal communication, but use the word communication, like human communication." Um, now we know about lots of uh, human instincts. Um, now uh, understand about three broad classes of instincts that there are uh, instincts that are to do with and both, all these instincts have to be there in order for us to kind of produce the next generation. So they have the same kind of thing in common. But uh, there's an instinct to do with kind of eating and sex and that sort of thing. Uh, we don't like talking about that in public. Uh, much better talk about uh, uh, instinct to do with attachment and making relationships and being warm towards and fuzzy towards each other. And that's good as well. But there's a third human instinct that actually is not that much talked about, which is much more relevant to what you guys and what psychological therapists in the broader sense do, and that's to do with human communication. Now, as human beings, um, one of the big tasks that we have uh, when we are born into this world is um, how are we going to transmit the things that we have discovered onto the next generation? Because when you think about it, some of the things that we use, some of the objects we use, it's not obvious how you use them. I mean, uh, you have a, give us, just take a spoon as an example, okay? I mean, it's obvious to you that a spoon you use to eat soup with, but if you are a kind of two-year-old child, is it that obvious that you eat, use it for eating rather than for beating your brother on the head with? Uh, it seems much more useful uh, in beating somebody else. So, you know, how, how, do we, how do we acquire culture, which is really what's essentially human. Well, there is a, 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 a couple of uh, uh, 
developmental psychologists that have actually uh, produced a theory about this. And uh, uh, they suggested that uh, there is uh, something that's called the pedagogic stance that we take towards children. And a pedagogic stance is a, is a very specific and particular thing. That is that we have a, a certain uh, sequence of actions that we engage as adults uh, or as teachers that tells a, an infant or a child that the next thing that we are communicating is something they should acquire as a general piece of knowledge, as something that belongs to human culture in general, not just to that specific situation. Okay? So, for example, I'm sure you guess what these things are, but as, um, uh, as parents, we engage in all this. So, for example, uh, we know um, that um, uh, if you start speaking to children in a particular intonation, um, uh, what psychologists call motherese, I don't know whether you ever come up with it, it's a language, if you start speaking motherese, the, the kid gets the idea the next piece of information that you're relaying is something they can generalize, it's something that's part of culture. Um, another, these are called, uh, by cells, by others, ostensive cues. So we give a bunch of ostensive cues to the individual, and then they know that it's something that they have to, to learn. One of the simplest ostensive cues is just looking someone in the eye and saying, hello, hello, not very complicated. Um, but, uh, and usually it's even better if you use the person's name. So you can say, hello, Domini. Just like that. <laughs> Hello, Dominic. Oh, yeah, just, just, uh, uh, now, the, the experiment has been done, uh, uh, which I was going to show you, uh, but uh, I can probably better demonstrate it, that you're faced with a 12-month-old infant. Um, and uh, uh, it's all 13, 14 months old. Anyway, you, uh, and uh, who's able to already if you know, if you ask for, reach for an object and, and hand it to you. They, they can do that. Uh, so what you do is you look at the two objects, neither of them are, uh, that they've seen before, and you smile at one and say, lovely, whatever it is, and you go to the other one. Okay, that's it. That's all it. That's the total experiment. Okay? So, oh, lovely. Ugh. And you ask the infant to give you one, okay? And uh, interestingly, um, they will give you the one that you like, okay? <coughs> Not surprising. Now, you then replace that person with a new person the infant hasn't seen yet. And that person asks for one of the objects to be handed to them, okay? Get it? Not very complicated. Now, the infant will randomly hand one or other of the objects unless initially the experimenter created a relationship with the child and said, Hello, Domini. Ooh. Oh. Like that. Now I'm replaced by somebody else. And then Dominic will give this new person the nice thing. Do you see the, the you understand the experiment? Now, basically, this is uh, a, a tiny part of what we now recognize as a kind of epistemic superhighway that gets created in all our brains to acquire knowledge about the world, to learn that you know forks you use to uh, stick your uh, food in and that uh, uh, God is great and uh, a whole range of other things in between. Uh, but in order to learn that culture, we learn it far better if the person who is teaching us has set up a set of ostensive cues. And the ostensive cues that we use as humans are very simple. One is personal recognition, other is contingent relating, that is to say, 
the person relates contingently, relates depending on how the other one is, how the pupil is reacting to the teacher, the teacher is reacting, adjusting their reaction to, to the pupil, okay? Contingent responding. Uh, a whole range of fairly simple cues that ensure that you, you, you remember, I mean, didn't you have the experience that at school you learn from some teachers and not from others? Okay? That, I mean, I certainly did. But you, know, you learn from certain teachers who you feel are interested in you. If they're interested in you, you actually, but other than that, you don't learn from them, you learn what you have to know when they are present. Okay? You learn about them, not the subject matter that they are teaching. And this is where it, it becomes interesting. Because um, uh, what we have in most of the patients that we see, sadly, in CNWR, are individuals whose history of interrelations with other people led to a closure of the epistemic superhighway. They're no longer able to learn from others. They are inflexible, they are rigid. Despite their experiences, they will not change. You know what I mean? And that's what we struggle with. So what do we do? What do we all do as psychological therapists? In all the different forms of therapy that we offer, we create, a, with using a set of ostensive cues. Hello. Exactly, hello Dominic. And you know, basically, we recreate a sense of what we call epistemic trust. That is, they, their interpersonal experiences have led to a failure of epistemic, willing to learn from the cultural context that they are in, that forces them to behave in rigid <coughs> and maladaptive ways, unable to change even if they want to. We put them in a range of different situations where what they, the experience they have is someone who is interested in them, who is responding to them contingently in a range of different ways. With uh, drama, with uh, uh, visual, with music, with whatever else. But they feel for a, a brief time that they actually matter. They as people matter. And that frees that epistemic superhighway. We don't cure them. We like to think that our metaphors uh, cure them. I have to disappoint you. It may just be that it's actually not us. That what we achieve, actually, is a change of mindset in them so that they're once again open to be influenced by others, open to be influenced by the people around them, by their, in their relationships, uh, by people who are, have actually been benign and benevolent towards them before, but they were unable to see it. <coughs> because that learning path was close to them. So what I'm getting, what is the future of, this is what uh, uh, Dominic set me as the actual <coughs> question, on the future of research in psychological therapies in the NHS. What do I think the future of research in psychological therapies is? I think that the future of research is trying to understand what you guys do that actually helps re-establish in our patient a sense of epistemic trust, a sense that human knowledge and human information as communicated by other, by fellow human beings can be trusted, can be relied on. And that is why no matter what we do, no matter how diverse the therapies are that we practice, actually does have a final common pathway of us being able to make our patients feel that they are important to us, they are unique human beings, and we understand them. And that's, you know, okay, I'm pushing my 
stick here, this is, sounds very much like mentalizing, and it is. I'll be honest about it. But I'm not saying that that's the only way. That is just one of many ways, and it may not even be the most efficient way of doing it. It could be that dance therapy is the most efficient way that you can help people reestablish epistemic trust. It wouldn't surprise me that in this room, as we said last time, is the most effective solution uh, for this, what I consider to be a generic uh, human difficulty associated with most mental disorder. What we need to do is to focus our attention, to be scientific, <coughs> that is to actually combine our intuition, our human intuition that we use with at the same time a willingness to scrutinize our own actions sufficiently to be able to actually join the culture of transmitting knowledge to the next generation, to help them do it better so that the knowledge just doesn't just rest with us, but we transmit it actually for everybody else to be able to uh, use it uh, equally well. That's the thought for today. <laughs> okay, thank you.